our intention isn't to try to make a ton of money off these shows. Yeah. The riches that we're trying to produce are riches of the spirit, riches of social capital, riches of that's the mission of this place. If we were trying to make money, I don't know what would happen. Uh, theater is actually a really lousy business to go into if you're trying to make money. Ask, ask commercial producers. The fact that occasionally we can is fantastic. And we certainly take those commercial profits and feed them right back into the mission. But it would be very much a mistake for anybody to think that that's sufficient to fund everything we do. We are without doubt the most successful nonprofit theater in American history at creating hits. Chorus Line and Hamilton alone would be more successful than any other shows that anybody had moved. But they're not enough to fund the place down here. They're enough to expand what we're able to do. But we need philanthropic support from many, many other sources to have the range of work that we have down here. So maybe we can go there, Oscar, because it's my understanding that pre-COVID, yeah. the public theater's top line was around $60 million. That's right. And now post-COVID, we're somewhere between 45 and $49 million of top line. So down somewhere between 17 and 25%. What are some of the reasons and forces that are affecting ticket sales? And then also, if you could touch on the amount of government support that uh, the public receives, which was surprisingly small when you think about a 45 a $49 million budget or a $60 million budget. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about that. Sure. And just to paint a picture that's even a little worse than that, um, expenses for almost everything the theater does have risen between 40 and 50%. So our budget has shrunk by that much. But also everything we do costs dramatically more. So our activity has shrunk even further than that implies. Our staff has shrunk even further than that implies. So it's it's really a crisis, and I should say not just for the public, for the entire nonprofit field across the country. This last four years has been devastating. We've lost a whole lot of theaters. I think we're going to lose a whole lot more. I've been spending an enormous amount of my time working uh, within the national field, lobbying Washington for more money. This is a, a field-wide crisis. Um, the, the, the dependence, uh, the reason that this has gotten so tough is partly the aforesaid rise in expenses, which has to do is somewhat with labor costs, of course, also with labor rules, work rules, which have gotten much tougher um, in the wake of the pandemic and not necessarily wrongly. Um, also has to do with materials, cost of materials, everything is just dramatically more expensive. And also that there has been, the audience has not fully come back. And there's a reluctance among older audiences who are still a little COVID sensitive. There's the experience that many people had during COVID of sitting on their couches and watching Netflix and not everybody has been broken of that habit. Uh, and there's the, as you all know, the emptying out of Midtown, the hundreds of thousands of people who used to spend their work days in Midtown Manhattan, grab a drink and go see a show. They're now in New Jersey or Westchester or Pennsylvania, and it's a whole different deal to go to a show after a work day there. So all of those things have depressed um, uh, our, our bottom line. Uh, but also there's been an erosion of philanthropy, and some of it is the natural experience of having fewer people see our shows, being able to produce less. That's eroded philanthropy. A, a deeper worry, though, for me, involves a little bit of history here, and forgive me, that the American system of private philanthropy for supporting culture is unique in the world. Mm -hmm. It's because most of the other industrialized nations had a feudal past. And there was always governmental support of the arts that sprang in the distant past from kings, from monarchies, and then it sprang from oligarchies. And when those countries became republics, democracies, the government just continued the supporting of the arts. Now um, they were supported by the people, by democracies. But that line of subsidy continued in England, all over the continent, both 
what used to be Eastern Europe and Western Europe. And so there are debates still about cultural policy, about the amount of money. There's some slashing of some of that subsidy in England recently, for example. But still, it dramatically outstrips any kind of subsidy that American culture has ever gotten from the government. 